But with that, let's welcome Professor Hale. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Vanessa, for uh, reminding me of uh, the winding path that got me here. And uh, it's always great to be back in Minneapolis. I want to thank my, personally, the, the folks who are hosting me here and making my stay such a happy one. Dragons of the North is what the fearful Southerners referred to as these, these Viking ships. Ships that could appear like lightning strikes on the horizon at sea, ships that could navigate rivers and small streams in Europe, getting up the Seine as far as Paris, uh, spreading havoc and fear and, and looting and pillaging and all those Viking uh, obsessions wherever they went. But to me, they are more than that. Uh, to me, they are the single most emblematic, beautiful, and deeply interesting single artifact that I know of from planet Earth. Uh, I think it's, it's great to take them bow on, as you would have seen them standing on the beach, plowing through the waves toward you, and then to appreciate the, the art, uh, look at it as, as an abstract, uh, as delicate as a lily, but capable of carrying an, an army of fearsomely armed Vikings across the seas uh, to distant parts and extending the Viking influence over an entire continent. Most of us in this room remember NASA's early engagements with outer space. They had a project to beam into space images that they felt were emblematic of us, us Earth dwellers. And so we see the sun shining down on an array of planets. Uh, we see a little thing designating Earth as the special one that has sent this voyager out into the universe. We see uh, a pair of middle-aged, young middle-aged Caucasian people representing the entire humanity of, of planet Earth, and of course, the, the guy taking charge to be the waving one to say, I'm, just talk to me. Um, all of this is emblematic. I'm, I'm not, and I, I'm making more fun of us than I should. I think it was a, a worthy effort to try to communicate more than just dots and dashes to our intergalactic neighbors. But it's always made me think, well, I don't like this, what would I have sent? What images would I have proposed to represent the highs, the lows, the, the greedy, rapacious, warlike elements of our nature, but also the artistic creativity, the almost spiritual visions that we're capable of? So what would it be? It would be, for me, a Viking ship. Uh, the wind in its sails, the oars, emblematic of the people inside, powering through the water, and the pure geometric perfection of the ship itself. We are bedeviled in modern times by fantasy Vikings. Let's deal with one thing right away. No Viking ever wore a horned helmet. <laughs> that would of course be to channel the power of a bull, which is a very valuable thing for any fighting persons, person, especially in non-soldier-like armies. Bulls are very hard to keep in line. They don't play or fight well together. So you're supposed to be talking about the inner force of the inside. As we'll see, Viking ancestors, but not Vikings themselves, did wear the famous horned helmets. We also have fantasy Vikings. Uh, all of us know the very mixed character and adventures of, of Hagar the Horrible uh, with his horned helmet and his dragon ship that looks like an inflatable toy for your bathtub. And of course, I'm in Viking country right now. Uh, proud to be so, proud to be in a place where the Viking spirit lives on, and believe me, Vikings would have been very proud of you all, too. <laughs> um, but even in New Zealand, you can find transplanted Viking descendants who have named their, their communities things like Danavirka. Danavirka was the work of the Danes, a gigantic defensive wall, their earthen version of the Great Wall of China, which was supposed to keep out barbarians who were demonstrably stronger than they were. And that name has been taken for this, this New Zealand town, along with one of our fantasy Viking figures with his horned helmet. These are the people who had the horned helmets. Celts, thousand years before the Vikings. And this is a spectacular uh, one that was fished out of the River Thames in London from a tribe, a Celtic tribe, that lived on the Thames long before the Anglo-Saxons showed up. And what it does is channel the power of a bull 
into the warrior who, who wears it. Uh, so we've had fantasy Vikings elsewhere, that wondrous American poet, not read and recited as much today as I would like to see, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, wrote a long epic a poem, has to be epic if it's Vikings, The Skeleton in Armor, which is about a legend he'd heard about an old Viking warrior who landed here in, in American soil and had various adventures and eventually found a, a fair maiden and carried her off uh, over the seas back home. You're seeing what immediately inspired the poem. Near where Longfellow was living, there was a discovery of a skeleton. It had some metal armor on it and there were these metal arrow points. Uh, the last thing this skeleton could be is Viking. None of this is Viking material. We're not sure what is the early date, somewhere in the very early colonial period. But it inspired a pretty, uh, to me and my childhood, very epic sounding and inspiring poem, which I doubt is read by one person in America more often than a decade. But this is what inspired it. This is a great purported Viking tower that was tied into the, the Longfellow poem, claimed to have been built by Vikings, led by that chief you see grasping the fair maiden of America who he is taking away from her home and conveying back to Viking country and freedom. The skeleton in armor, he, meet, he finds a skeleton and the skeleton speaks and tells him his tale. It's a grand poem, a great concept, totally fraudulent. That is a, a mill, the base of a mill tower you may have seen in Greek pictures of modern mills, that cylindrical drum-like tower that supports the pinwheel-like sail. Uh, at one time it belonged to Benedict Arnold uh, during his time as governor of the colony. So it's quite recent. It's, uh, it's nothing to do with the Vikings, but once a myth gets started, it takes a lot of killing. In the 19th century, nobody really had an idea what Viking ships looked like, except they only had one sail. Uh, that's like, uh, it, it even looks like Noah's Ark, uh, especially that little, uh, <laughs> Stern Castle back there, and the, uh, their Arab elements, pirate ships, and a, a dog-like creature uh, with bared teeth and there at the prow. As, and I like the dancing Viking chief with his horned helmet on the shore, uh, celebrating the arrival of Vikings here in the New World. These are the true originators. We saw that, that, uh, that Celtic helmet with the sort of broad horns. These are, these are the artifacts that gave us that Viking stereotype. These are Bronze Age Vikings. They were found in Scandinavia, in tombs of honored dead leaders, and those are fantasized bull horns with the power, the force, the virility, the potency of a bull. But look how also an eagle has been incorporated in the center, the staring eyes and that, that sort of almost abstracted hooked beak of the eagle. A bird of prey allied with a bull. The bull is the, the, the land power of the, of the Vikings. The bird of prey soaring out over the, over the seas, the sea eagles striking from above, striking like lightning. Everything that the Vikings felt was essential about their nature. So we got a ceremonial horned helmet, Bronze Age Denmark, uh, staring eyes, eagle's beaks, and talk about a nightmarish uh, biological compound to mix a charging bull with an all-seeing eagle. They did it. Abstraction in art began a long time ago. We also find some uh, emblems of their, their work. Can you see across the back of this Gundestrup cauldron, a treasure from the pre-Viking Norse, can you see there's a figure seated in what's almost a sort of Buddhist uh, pose with the interlocking bent legs, surrounded by animals, and he's wearing stag's horns. So there's an old tradition in Northern Europe of, the, of this idea of males buying, acquiring the potency of, of male animals, uh, charging stags, uh, bulls, eagles, through their headgear. And there he is close up, the Gundestrup cauldron. And from about the same time, look to the left, we see a very Viking-like helmet on a god. We're not sure which god. He seems to be a, a, a Viking or Celtic version of the of the Greek god Hermes, the, the Roman god Mercury, who is involved in contraptions, contrivances, technology, spinning a wheel. It's a symbolic wheel of something. There's a giant gripping its other side. We're in a myth that hasn't survived. But the horns uh, lead us to something essential about the Vikings. They saw themselves as beasts, as fearsome threats to other people. 
They were loving family folks at home, but the world was shown a different face. There's the entire panel on that Gundestrup cauldron, a little known but fascinating artwork. I got involved with these Vikings during my, uh, my graduate studies at Cambridge University when, as a descendant of Vikings, I have the Dupuytren syndrome that descends to certain unfortunate people where your fingers start to, 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 to contract like claws. I've got a very mild version. Mine stopped with my, uh, my pinky on my left hand, about the most expendable finger one has. And the original Dupuytren, however, was a grenadier in Napoleon's army. First time this was, this was uh, recorded, his whole body contracted, all, the, all the, the muscles to the point where he could lie on the ground with his heels on the ground, his head on the ground backwards, and his body bent like a bow because every single tendon had contracted. Uh, so he got that from Viking ancestry. Remember, he, he was from Normandy, that fellow, Dupuytren. That's Northman country. That's the corner of France that was taken over by roving Vikings a thousand years ago. He was a descendant of Vikings. So anybody that's got this, and I may be, not be the only uh, person so afflicted in the room, uh, you're a Viking, my friend. <laughs> and thousands of years before the Vikings themselves, that's where we see the, the horned helmets. We're in the Bronze Age here, a Bronze Age that lasted in Scandinavia centuries after it ended in the Mediterranean. We're familiar with that Bronze Age. The Bronze Age that created the pyramids at Giza, the Trojan War epics, the great cities of Babylonia. And Bronze Age is, is, the, year, is the, the, the time of elite warriors. Copper is common, but bronze is an alloy of nine parts copper and one part tin. Tin was scarce. Tin is a scarce metal. By the end of the Bronze Age, they were having to send all the way to Britain to get bronze from Cornwall, I'm sorry, the tin from Cornwall, those mines. So that was why it was an aristocratic society led by kings and, and warrior lords. Only a few could afford the metal because of the scarcity of the tin. Some of those few were godlike leaders in what later became Viking country. These are smooth granite rock surfaces, smoothed by the glaciers of the Ice Age. So they become like pages on which you can carve elaborate scenes, pecking it into the hard granite, and they peck their whole mythology, all their gods, all their heroes, their ships, everything, into thousands upon thousands of these scenes. This, for me, is the greatest little-known bonanza of ancient human art on the planet. And I devoted my, my work, I love boats, ships, rowing, and uh, worked with a, a fellow, John Coles, at Cambridge, who'd studied the Bronze Age of Scandinavia and Northern Europe. And he told me, no one ever looked at these images, these scenes, and pulled out the boats. As you see, the boat here is not a regular, a regular war ship. Those are sacred trees growing on top of it. This is a, a boat that has, has cruised across the waters to a new land, bringing the gifts of agriculture, of fruit trees, of new life. And, being saluted by the, the warriors as it comes from the world of the gods into their mortal world, Scandinavia. They are very proud of their masculinity. Everyone has a sword dangling down on one hip and uh, from the center of their, their uh, bodies, a very erect phallus uh, amplifying the male generative organ. And uh, as, as a friend of mine said, they clearly like to feel like a man. Um, but always the ships, always these magical vessels that carried them around. This is what I, Vikings, the descendants of those Bronze Age horn helmeted guys, this is what they looked like. They didn't want a horned helmet in battle that the enemy sword or spear could catch the horn and tip the whole helmet off your head. That's just asking for trouble. So these are, are caps that have looked this way, and if you look at the Normans in the Bayou Tapestry, that wonderful... Uh, a uh, long ribbon of cloth that the, the women of the, the Bayou Abbey embroidered with scenes of the Normans, the descendants of these Viking Northmen who crossed under William the Conqueror to Britain and created the regime we're still living with today. This is what they look like. You can even see those nose pieces that the, the nuns worked into their tapestries. And in the, the right scene, you see one of them plowing away, uh, battle axe in hand, sword in the other hand, a, a double threat, and the horned helmet, meaning he doesn't need to worry about his head, and he's got perfect vision, which many, many helmets didn't give you. Back to our, our Swedish rock art, which I was studying and analyzing for my doctoral work. Here the Swedish Park Service has kindly come along with red paint and made it possible to see 
the, the images, and I imagine they were painted at the time. They'd get red ochre and put it in so these would pop out at you as they, they reenacted ceremonies that they had commemorated in these amazing extents of rock art, to me the, the least known of all the world's great primitive art. Um, and these were probably sites of sacrifices, of fires, of, of worship as well as places for enshrining these. So I spent um, several summers going over there, finding, uh, recording, and then analyzing all of, the, all of these strange ship types. And they'd have been uh, reconstructed by a Swedish scholar, a very great guy uh, named Marstrander, as skin boats. The Celtic peoples liked skin boats. You make a frame, you spread ox hides over it, you've got a waterproof thing for inshore waters and rivers and streams, and it's very lightweight so the, the crew can pick it up and carry it, portage it over land. And some of these images uh, were believed by him to be skin boats. I didn't believe this for a minute. Uh, I'm a wooden boat guy, and I was aware that elsewhere in the world, the Central African lakes, the local African tribes had made wooden canoes that look exactly like this, with that front thing like the runner of a sled coming out there. That's so you can approach the beach prow first and run your vessel up on the beach, jump out and take the enemy, rather than having to reverse your boat so you can back onto the, on the shore, and that's going to be a very vulnerable thing to you if you're trying to stage an invasion. So this is, this is why I have PhD after my name today. This is the family tree of the Viking ship you see at the bottom going back all the way through wooden vessels to vessels that we have from the archaeological record. We have Stone Age dugouts, like the top one. We have dugouts where they started boring holes on the upper edge of that dugout and sewing, stitching a new plank, which they'd gotten by cutting up an old worn out dugout, to raise the freeboard. So now as you go into waves and get away from the inland waterways and the creeks and out onto the sea, that stitching is why we still call the line between planks on a boat seams, and we don't say that about the wooden floor and its planks, because the floor was always nailed down. These were originally for centuries sewn together. So that's a seam still in English. We're culturally Viking descendants today. Below that is what I was studying, these thousands of Bronze Age uh, carvings on stone and, and wonderful images on the, the bronze razors that the men shaved themselves with. These are their warships. And that's got to be a mythological scene. Those are two giants or gods at either end of the ship. And then their human descendants, perhaps the captains of that, that ship, leading the ship into battle. You see the axes emphasized and those, those dragon heads at either end. These were already dragon ships a thousand years and more before the Vikings co-opted the term themselves. We've got the short spring vessel from Denmark, keeping those runners like sleds at either end. And then with the Iron Age, uh, the Great Depression time, all the abundant glory of the aristocratic kingdoms of the, the Bronze Age has imploded. It's like uh, the 29 crash, and it went on for centuries. That's the Iron Age. Iron is the most abundant element on Earth. And Iron Age is the people's metal, iron. Uh, copper, tin, aristocrats, kings, iron, the people. Everybody can have iron. It takes a higher fire to smelt it, but once you got it, it's... And its other problem is the, the bronze gets a patina, iron rusts. So now you've got to take care of all your stuff. There's, there's trade-offs with this, but in the end, iron and steel are what have made our modern world. And the, the, the end that day have switched over to that, and we're starting to see the recognizable Viking ship at the bottom. Let's look at a royal Viking burial mound because the kings and queens of the Scandinavian world believe that Valhalla was a place on high, far off, and you needed to make your voyage to Valhalla in a ship, spiritually speaking. So they were buried with their ships, and in those ships were buried their treasure and often human sacrifices and animal sacrifices. Let's look at Ladby in Denmark, a discovery in the latter part of the 20th century. The ship itself had decayed away, all the wood was gone. You can see that's a green, lush kind of a hillside where it was found. That was the mound that was erected over the ship. But it was put together with iron rivets, and all the iron rivets survived, and they gave the shadow-like DNA of the ship's form. They were carefully mapped, and that gave the length of the ship, its breadth, the number of, of uh, planks in the, in the, uh, in the uh, keel, uh, the, the hull of the ship. So this is our, one of our important discoveries of Viking ships. Uh, it's 
they built the museum around it because it, was, it wasn't a ship they could lift out. It was an impression in the soil. So in this amazing museum, you were looking at what you just saw now enshrined in, in, in a plexiglass case with the, um, the metal structure, beautifully lit. And from that, they have been able to uh, measure all of the details and uh, adding in things like the wonderful anchor that was found along with it, with its chain. And near the front, the prow, they found these little curly cues. They are bronze, and they were supposed to be the, the, the mane on a fantasy horse, a seahorse, that was the figurehead of this ship. So uh, the, the Viking descendants got into experimental archaeology. Let's rebuild one. We've got all the specs and all the measurements. Let's make our own Ladby ship, and here it is. And you can see the, the seahorse at the front with its little mane. Uh, the, the place for all of the warriors to row, that one single big square mast, or ma sail on the mast, that is, and single sail, that is the Viking uh, moniker. They're always oared ships. If the wind is fair, they'll run up that, that sail, but they can't tack. Uh, you need the triangular lateen sails that Europeans are going to borrow from the, the Arabs in order to do that. So it's a, it's a grand ship. This is a warship. They make them broad in the beam for colonizing efforts and for merchandising. <laughs> But for warships, they are sleek and menacing. Simple conveyances for masses of warriors and a mystical being, that, that in this case, that horse, that is the power that will enable them, to, enable them to prevail. How long did they prevail? 300 years. What's America's run? Well, a couple of centuries so far. So uh, we will see if we can be as enduring as the Vikings were. Let's now search beyond the epic poems for these historical Vikings that still uh, are, are a very powerful part of the imagination. Where did they get their name? A vic in Norse languages is a creek or inlet from the sea. That's a vic. They're people of the vics. But they turned it into a verb. If you sail down the vic each spring, you are going a viking. It's a, it's a pastime. It's a job. It's a mission. Viking and we mispronounce it with Viking, we're stuck with that. Vikings are people who do this. They tend the farms and are with their families through the, the winter, and then they get in these fabulous longships and they go down the Vic and out into the world. They started with rivers. Every yellow line on there, other than the ones going around Britain and the western coast, those are the rivers of Europe, of Russia, all the way down into the Black Sea, nobody was safe. These were shallow draft. They could row right up creeks. They were the terrors of the early Middle Ages. I think they were also the spur that shook those early Middle Ages out of their church-based complacency and made them get international, made them get militaristic, made them get adventurous themselves to survive against the Vikings. And then there's the Western travels, starting from Norway, where we get Norse, the North people. They went out west, Scotland and the British Isles, then discovered Iceland, formed communities there, Greenland, short-lived communities there, and around and down to Newfoundland and that Labrador, where they found a, found a small community at a place called Lance o Meadows. And that, we're going to be looking at it, that is the furthest west reach of the Vikings. But when you consider that Vikings were settling in Newfoundland at the same time that some Vikings were serving as the palace guard to the Byzantine emperor in Constantinople and raiding the coasts of Syria and the Black Sea, these are the people who jolted Europe out of their Middle Ages and their Dark Ages. These are the people with a, a global scope, with an adventurous spirit, an inquisitive mind, and an openness to, to new ideas. They did convert to Christianity when that was patently the profitable thing to do, and they'd be good, strong Christians ever since, though they were, they were very taken with Luther's um, modifications of Roman Catholicism. Luther did not think he was found in a new church, and they, be, they become Lutheran. So that's the, the norm for religion among modern Vikings. They were a name to scare children with during their time of power. Uh, just before 800, 
common era or AD, which I like to think of as meaning advancing dates, uh, we got the first Viking raids on British monasteries. They came like wolves from the sea. They struck without warning. They attacked without mercy. Uh, they didn't kill a whole lot of people. They wanted the loot, not a trail of corpses. And they wanted to leave the people so they could produce more profitable loot and the Vikings could come back in a few seasons. So it was a, it was a new way of living that shook Europe out of the Dark Ages. All of Western Europe began to defend itself against the Vikings, but borrow some Viking ideas. They would run their wonderful Viking ship up onto the sandy shore in shallow water. It's there poised, ready to be the escape route if they run into a power that, that threatens to, to kill them. They, each man drops his oar, grabs his shield and sword and spear, and hits the beach, kind of like Normandy. And in fact, they conquered Normandy. Rollo, an early Danish leader, landed at the mouth of the Seine, which I don't think actually looks like this. <laughs> um, but it's a great image, and I love the Viking ships coming in under full sail with the, the Atlantic wind behind them. And then the, the, the follower of Rollo behind him, who's clearly posing for his photo op, um, <laughs> with that, that ravaging sea eagle as the emblem of the whole Viking gang. And then if it's hard, you're, you're so distracted by the ships and Rollo himself, look at the foreground. There are all the monks and, and uh, Christians running away, holding up helplessly their, their crucifix to try to counteract unsuccessfully the fierce sea eagle of our invading Danes. So a, a wonderful uh, tw early 20th century composite uh, historical image that I think really captures what was in Christians' views, the nightmare that was descending upon them. And they didn't stop there. They heard about this big city up this river that we call the Seine, and they just rode up to it and they assaulted Paris. They managed to get some loot. They managed to set fire to some of the buildings with flaming arrows shot over the walls, but they couldn't handle fortifications. You gotta be serious. You gotta turn into soldiers. Get some military engineers in there if you're gonna do this. Well, that ain't Viking. That's just too boring. They're after the kick, hit, quick hit, the loot, and get away. Uh, but they kept coming back and demanding tribute from these Frankish kings, as they were to do of the English kings. In fact, the people of Europe got a name for it, Danegeld, gold for the Danes, and you had to keep it on hand to buy them off and make sure they didn't destroy you and take away your women and children and leave you penniless. The flip side of Viking rovers is, as I said, being merchants and traders. They're some of the economic engine that gets Europe into the free markets of the later Middle Ages and the Renaissance. So everybody traveled with this, scales for weighing silver and gold, Coins for easy transactions. Some of these are Viking coins. And little plugs of, of, of uh, precious metals to, where the coins fail. What does this mean? They're always out a roving and a Viking, but whenever they meet powers, as I said, demonstrably stronger than they are, out come the scales, out come the coins. We are peaceful merchants <laughs> hoping to, to trade with you and uh, enhance both of our futures. And in some cases, they put their ships on their coins, those wonderful double-ended, beautiful Viking ships, uh, in this case, emphasizing the sail. Sea battles are almost unknown in the Viking tradition. Great mariners and naval people though they are, this is the only important uh, sea battle. Early on in their tradition, a group of rival Danes with folks from Norway and Sweden on board get together at a place called Hafersfjord, and they decided to duke it out. This isn't a nautical naval battle. They have harnessed their ships in the two navies side by side, like there was a pre-arranged truce why they did this rather complicated maneuver. And then with only the poor rowers on the outside ship in each of these floating islands of ships, they eased each other close enough so the warriors on deck could then duke it out with their weapons in what was now a land battle on the surface of the water. Not, not a very uh, glorious episode in the annals of naval warfare. But on the other hand, they made up for that with the ceremonialism of these ships. The most interesting writer of, who coincided with the Vikings was an Arab, a widely traveled <laughs> Arab named Ibn, which means Sir, Fadlan, who came from the area around Baghdad and was sent by the Caliph to get to know the strange peoples on the Caliph's borders. The Caliphs are on that holy Islamic crusade to conquer the world, well, there are these troublesome 
fighters up north, let's get some information. They sent Ibn Fadlan, his preserved record of this, and he made many other trips too, is well worth getting an English translation of. You're looking at a scene that he witnessed. You know that tradition about Viking ships being burned up with the king on board, uh, the, the great Kirk Douglas movie of the Viking ends up with poor dead Kirk laid out and his ship pushed out to sea and the flaming arrows, and that's the point where we're gonna end today. But this is an actual scene that convinced uh, Ibn Fadlan, A, they are uh, barbarians, possibly just animals, and B, we don't want to tackle them. Um, he described how a Viking king had died. He missed that. The Viking king then, his ship was pulled up on the edge of the sea, or uh, the body of water, and his own tent with its dragon heads was erected and his body was put inside. His treasures were heaped into the ship, so when he got to Valhalla, the hall of the valiant, dead, he would be able to present himself in style with treasures. But more than that, he needed a servant. He needed a fellow human to be there to show all, to represent all the subservient people who had called this man king. And it had to be one, it had to be a willing victim and it had to be one of his own servants. So somehow the girl was chosen who it would be and she was fed what she was told was a ceremonial meal with a liquor that made her woozy. They load the king on the ship. They load all of his treasures on. They load the girl on. They kill her. And then one of his warriors strips off all of his clothes, grabs a torch in his right hand. With his left hand, he claps that hand over his buttocks and covers his anus. And he walks backward to the ship till he's within range, throws the torch backwards over his head. It lands on the tent and the whole thing goes up in flames. And in one great bit of thousand-year-old dialogue, Ibn Fadlan records that he turned to the Viking standing next to him with an inquiring look, and the Viking looked at him and said, you Arabs are fools. This was not the comment that Ibn Fadlan was expecting, and he said in his gentle, all, all inquiring way, what makes you say so? Having just witnessed this nightmare, you bury your dead in the cold earth, where they rot away and the worms destroy them. We send those we love and revere to Valhalla in the twinkling of an eye. Look, our king is already gone. And I turned, writes Ibn Fadlan, and it was true. Ship, tent, treasure, king were nothing but smoke and ashes. So that's the one eye, eye witness account we have of what these terrible ceremonies meant to the Vikings who were participating in them. As I say, Ibn Fadlan, the Volga River, ninth century of our era. All Vikings went to Valhalla in a boat, but some couldn't afford to give up the family boat, so they just made curbs of stones set up in boat burials to represent that boat that is in fact carrying them to the next world. We're very grateful to the Normans for hiring those, or hiring, uh, acquiring the services of the, the nuns in that abbey in Normandy to record the, the William the Conqueror's invasion of England. And it's kind of not, not clear from my old school book that Normandy is Northman country and the people who invaded England are, are these Anglo-Saxon types, or, or these Normans, not Anglo-Saxons, who are the descendants of Vikings and they're, they're in Viking ships. And so the women who did this, they, they make every row of planking a different color to show you how the ship is, is constructed. Uh, they emphasize, can you see the glorious dragon heads on that ship, front and back, Vikings at work, and that single grand square sail uh, overhead, warriors on board who are gonna have to throw down their oars and grab their weapons when they hit the beach because they are both. The ship's power and, and that force that will take the Normans ultimately in the, in the British Empire and other descendants all over the earth. It was a grand glorious thing in the 19th century when actual Viking ships started to pop up out of the ground. 19th century is an industrial age. They're digging deeper pits, deeper foundations, and these yielded Viking ships. This is an Oseberg ship, especially precious to us because it was the Viking burial ship of a queen a high-ranking woman who was buried here. So we get a different range of grave goods. This is an actual documentary photo of the moment. It's coming out of the earth. The earth was earth that never dried out. And look at the extraordinary scroll work still preserved a millennium later on the prow post rising, rising in its beautiful curve and the perfectly preserved planking. There it is in close up. And this is what makes a Viking ship 
They liked to double the strength of the ship along its seams. So they overlapped the two planks. That's called clinker built or lap strake. Overlapping strakes, overlapping planks, constructions. It's unique to the Vikings and they finally got in line with the rest of Europe, but it made their ships extra strong because the seam becomes a point of doubled strength rather than a vulnerable point that can pop if you hit a, hit a rock or let in the, the water easily. And there is the Oseberg ship from above with its beautiful mast step. Can you see that massive wooden structure carved out to hold the mast socketed right in the middle of the ship? And that, uh, that wooden tent-like triangle in the middle, that's for the queen's funeral. That's her tent where she will be buried. And we've got the remains and the dimensions of that. There it is it's in its museum. Um, of all the beautiful Viking ships, this is the most beautiful. It was probably her luxury yacht. Uh, it's too delicate for, for warfare and troop transport. And this is my favorite museum in the world. They made it feel like a place of worship. And the ships are the total focal point. And can you see that thing that looks like a spot from where at the back on the right, the, the sermon would be read by the officiating priest? That's your lookout point to get up and look down into the ship and observe it from close quarters. Um, huge crowds come. The weaponry, all of the Queen's things are, are around the walls. It's basically a monographic museum. And this lovely thing, dragons are even present. That is the steering oar. And you've got a gold-eyed dragon grasping the oar in its mouth to endow its power even to the, the uh, member of the crew who's just assigned to steer the boat. It was scientifically reconstructed. It was sailed and rowed by a volunteer crew. And despite everyone saying, oh, this, it's, you know, it's, it's totally unseaworthy, it was surprisingly seaworthy, but only for inshore waters. Can you see those two pale planks that are the top strakes of the hull? They had to be added. Computer, computer scientists got to work on why is this ship not quite seaworthy in the open sea? They said, add two more planks. There they are. But they weren't there on the original. So this was a, like a pleasure yacht for the queen. This was not a serious Viking boat. And probably she had had the sides lowered for more access to the shore, for a more open yacht-like feeling. The, the, the backbone is, of course, that keel, always made of oak, their strongest wood, and then the overlapping planks soar out on either side like wings. Uh, truly a mystical experience to visit the Oseberg ship. In 1892, America celebrated uh, the 400th anniversary of 1492 and that Italian coming over and discovering America. Well, the Vikings knew their sagas. They were not well known to anybody else, but they knew darn well they got there first. So a group of Vikings took the Oseberg ship type and reconstructed it without the extra, extra strakes. They left off the beautiful spiral dragon's heads at either end. They made it more, um, more uh, stout than hers but they still have a tent-like structure like hers, and they added, because they didn't know how to, how to do the, a single sail in the open Atlantic. So they've added the triangular uh, Latin sails from the Latin world that in the Middle Ages enabled everybody to sail into the wind. And or, Vikings would have run out their oars and powered into the wind. So it looks a little bit different. It was passed in mid-Atlantic by the steamer there who sent uh, telegraph notices about it back to uh, Norway on the one side and back to um, uh, America on the other to let them know they were coming. 1892-3, that winter, they, they crossed. And uh, were the Viking sagas right? Did Norse explorers really cross the Atlantic 500 years before Columbus? You bet they did. Here is that Viking reconstructed ship at the Chicago World's Fair, 1893, having in true Viking fashion gone up the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, the rivers of the world are, are Viking highways coming down to uh, Chicago. Some of those buildings in the background are going to become the Museum of Science and Industry today, which some of you may be aware date back to this world exhibition. And this was a centerpiece of that great World's Fair. Now going back to Lodby and our are things there. Let's look at the reconstruction now of that um, royal burial. You can see the similarity to the Oseberg ship, a burial also for a queen. Uh, you see the, the triangular tent structure where the, the corpse is going to be laid out and the sacrificial horses, probably the team, the, the team that served the king, these nobly bred horses, 
They have been slaughtered like human sacrifices and piled into the prow. We see the artist's imagination of, they can't all be slaughtered at once, so the later ones can smell the blood and they have to be dragged in the artist's imagination to the site. But these were violent ceremonies of getting the king, getting the queen to the next world with their human sacrifices or their, their horses. We know most about the, the Viking ships from an extraordinary discovery at a Danish Viking settlement at Roskilde which you can see the black dot, it's at the bottom of a long fjord, which starts up at the north, the big territory of modern Denmark on the left. And by accident, as they were trying to deepen the entrance to their harbor, they hit timber. They brought it up, scientists looked at it and they said, A, it's oak, and B, it's a thousand years old. They had hit a fleet of Viking ships that didn't sink by accident in this harbor, they were deliberately sunk to form a barricade at the harbor mouth to keep out other Vikings. <laughs> it was a, an artificial reef that would mean Vi Viking ships can't row or sail in to that approach. Look at what they found, this whole fleet of ships. And we can never thank the Vikings enough for determining that this group of, of five ships would be five different ship types. <laughs> we've got a long ship, the dragons we've been looking at, we can see that directly under the long ship is a ship of the same form, but very stout, shorter, broad. That's a merchant ship. It's called a canar. We're going to look at canars. And then a small fishing vessel, a smaller long ship. All of this, that's what it looks like above. Um, and down in those, what you're looking at in the center there is a coffer dam, a, a pentagonal coffer dam where they've built the dam around a space where the ships have been discovered and pumped out all the water. So this is going to be an archaeological site on ma land of a sort. It's on the harbor mud with all of the support systems up on the, the, the land and on ships nearby and these archaeologists working down. And look at the bottom left. You can see the dark oak planking in its, its strakes and its, its planks coming toward you, all carefully labeled with white numbers before being taken out. Sorry. So they had to excavate. They could, it was also soft. It was like cottage cheese. If you step on it, it's just going to smush. So they had to be lying on these overhead beams, reaching down with their hands, and can you see the hose? They can't use trowels. They are hosing the mud off. So this is a, a unique uh, excavation in the whole annals of archaeological history. But some of the preservation was unbelievable. This is a steering oar from the stern of one of the ships and preserved as if it were made and lost at sea yesterday. This was the giant of Danish archaeology and underwater archaeology, Ola Krumlin Peterson, who showed me around when I went over to uh, look at Roskilde and told me about some of the unbelievable challenges they had to overcome. And he also took me back in the restoration lab. His assistant there is carefully taking one of the hundreds of planks and applying the polyethylene glycol and the other preservatives that will stiffen it up again. We'll get back into the cellulose structure of the wood and make it something they can handle, preserve, save. And then you see the little model in front. They're going to make full-scale replicas. Eventually, they'll make them of all the ships. They've already managed of a couple. And that's the little Bronze Age short spring boat that they've already worked up a model for. In the museum, they create frames that show you the original form of the ship and tuck into those frames the now preserved wooden pieces that were found. Fortunately, in Denmark and Norway and Sweden, the Viking ship building tradition still survives. Here's an old fisherman going out in a Viking model ship fishing boat, paddling his way routinely to his fishing grounds. So there were people who could do it. I took this picture myself of one of the locally built boats. The Viking tradition was unbroken, and they took advantage of that in reconstructing these ships. I really love the one outfitted with an outboard motor uh, <laughs> and the little uh, picnic baskets in the prow. And they created this beautiful museum. They make it a heroic representation of all of the Viking things, which of course included fishing. So some of the times they go out and cast their nets, as the Viking would have done. And mercifully, one Viking shipwright or shipbuilder had been buried to go to Valhalla with his tools so he could keep on making ships for the gods. So they had every single tool in exact original form that was used to make a Viking ship. They brought in blacksmiths to make Lots of sets of these recently discovered Viking tools. That's an ax that's being hammered out there. This is one of the modern replicas for cutting and shaping the logs. Uh, the Swedes got interested. They've been Vikings too. And the only uh, oak 
uh, forests and ash forests big enough, with big enough trees, were in royal islands of Sweden where the, the trees had not been cut, clear cut. So they turned over the logs and that's a, a Viking recreated tool printing these. The DNA of Viking ships was this post, the stem post, because this is where the prime shipwreck determined the run of each planking. Can you see how the divided pile kind of flares out a little and then you got the notches where the end of each plank will fit in. That establishes the curve of the whole ship. They found these, they, that's the original hanging up on the wall, but here's one being reconstructed during the recreation of the Viking ship. And now they are, they didn't saw their logs, they split them. So every log has a, every plank has a triangular cross section tapering to the center of the, of the tree, expanding toward the edge, and that makes it, that overlap very easy to do because one of the edges is thin. So this was totally unknown until these ships had been discovered. That's what I'm explaining there. And they are flexible. They used green wood. They didn't season the wood. This is anathema to modern wooden boat builders, but they did it. And look at the flex in these, in these logs, uh, tree, uh, planks. That's how they could get the beautiful supple curve running over such long runs of individual planks. And as the ship seasons at use at sea, it will harden and make that, that curve permanent in a way that really wouldn't be possible if you'd just gone down to your local lumber uh, yard and bought modern two by fours, you wouldn't get that, that very easy to control bend. Here it is rising, the clamps holding the, the overlapped planks together and details. They, they found that they used different parts of the tree. They'd find curved trees for those rib sections that curve up the interior side of the boat. They would use bits that ran down into the roots for the angled things that held the rib sections in place. All of these volunteers bringing their recreated Viking tools, working away, and always using the Bayou Tapestry of those Norman seamstresses as a guide because, God bless them, they also had seen ships being made and they decided to show exactly how it was done and what were the tools. And so you can see a thousand years back, just before or after 1066, and then the modern group up there at Roskilde in Denmark. Fitting then, the, ramps, the uh, ribs go in later. We think of the ribs as the thing around which a, a hull is created. It's hull first for Vikings. The artistry goes into the curves of the hull and the, the ribs and the rib sections are just internal subsidiary strengthening devices. The hull is alive, it's got a lot of flex in it, it can bend with the Atlantic waves. And then, of course, very early on, they had to give the ship its head so it could see and observe what was going on. So there's our rather horse-like dragon's head going up at the prow, supervising. And again, they had so many examples to look at because Vikings traveled to the next world, to Valhalla, in ships. Even if they can only afford a stone carving on their, on their tombstone, they'll have a ship represented, thousands of representative Viking ships, very blessed as recreators to know so much. Then there was the sail. This gives you the proportion. The sail is the single biggest element. And they, for this experiment, they found Viking sheep, a direct descendants of, of the Viking sheep strain that had never been wiped out and supplanted by the modern breeds who are easier to work with the wool. They uh, located local weavers who uh, insisted on dressing themselves in, in Viking woolen clothing <laughs> and who are now using reconstructed Viking weave uh, patterns from, uh, remember some Viking tombs have been very well preserved with woolen uh, cloths and things. They used that as the pattern to use. This was not the normal thing that they did. Made the sails and then they brought in the, the ballast and one of the early ones they did was not a Viking longship. You remember those knars? Uh, we're looking at the first knar to be on the waters in a thousand years. And uh, this is a very sexist joke, but they were very sexist people. Knars, you can see, are kind of bluff, broad, and beamy. So they're, they're a compliment for a, a woman that they found sexy was, she's a Knar-breasted woman. <laughs> so the Knar is going to ride again, and here we see the Knar, low to the water, but very, very resilient. And you can see the larger crew, you can see lots of sh the ship devoted to a deep hull that can carry their treasures and their merchandise across the seas. The big day came, the launching of the very first of these ships. Queen Margareta of Denmark, descendant of ancient Viking kings and queens, came to cut the ribbon 
uh, not to uh, open the door, but to let the dragon out of its harbor. And they started taking their, their oars out, their sails out, and going everywhere in these ships. Uh, they had wonderful photographers to show what it looked like. They haven't quite mastered the uniformity on the rowing, but uh, <laughs> it'll come in time. They even went, went up the rivers of uh, Europe again. They, they took them up the, the, Sen, uh, the Thames. They took them up the Seine in Paris. Uh, the fellow with the side rudder working his way, steering now uh, with many curves of these inland waterways. And they did lots of sail trials to see how this, this single sail could do all of the tacking that a Viking ship needs. The, the folks working at it realized that the oak timbers of some of these ships, these are from Ireland, and some of the ships found in Denmark were from Irish oak. So this shows you the internationalization, the globalization of the Viking world. And they had found records of horses pulling the Viking ships overland so they could be in one body of water, get the horses to pull them over and attack then on the next body of water. You just throw a moving conveyor belt of stone, uh, sorry, wooden logs underneath and somebody at the back keeps grabbing the last log to be revealed and runs around and puts down on the front. So the conveyor belt moves with you across the acres or miles of, of flat land that gets you onto your next destination. This was all done again with those teams of horses. This was one of their triumphs. This is a real long ship. This is not a merchant vessel, not a canar, not a small thing. This is a royal long ship. They called it the Sea Stallion. Look at this thing. Uh, and we've recreated here what is on those Bayou Tapestry images. The, the colored Strakes of the, or uh, planking of the oar, uh, the, the ex incredible length of the thing. It's a pretty short crossing, only about 20 miles from Normandy over to England, so they could handle this. They would not take this out in the open sea. They, this is for moving troops over short distances of water for attacks. And of course, they went back to Paris, as I said. They were welcomed by uh, folks bringing Bordeaux wine and greeting them at the, the harbor side. And finally, we're going to end with our Viking ships in America. If we still have time to keep going, I, I'm getting, okay. Um, it, was, it was, had always been doubted that the Viking sagas were telling the truth when they said they got to land on the other side. Of course, they did not call it America. Uh, that's from Amerigo Vespucci, uh, a map maker who kindly, blithely assigned his own name to these two newly discovered continents. <laughs> uh, so uh, the Vikings knew it as Vinland and Markland. Markland is forest land. Vinland means a place you can grow vines or grapes. That means a very temperate place. That means they got pretty far south on this coast if it is America. And remember, we knew they had Greenland settlements and Iceland settlements. Iceland settlements never stopped being inhabited, and the Greenland settlements had been found. This is these Vikings on Greenland, southern Greenland. So they, they apparently, according to their own stories, went on west through those chains of islands over toward Labrador and then went down the coast. Folks, a Viking penny has been found in Maine. So they got way down, even into our territory. But the southern seas are home to these wretched Torito Navalis worms, the shipworm. And they're at risk from that. Even though they can pull the smaller boats out, you could never get that sea stallion longship up onto a beach to dry it out so the, the cycle of the, the shipworm that's eating it is, is done. So they need to stay in, in northern waters. Did they make it? Nobody believed this. Uh, Columbus had a hammerlock on being the European to discover America. Well, all the Scandinavians living in modern times felt they knew differently. They're in their epic stories of Leif Erikson, there was the grand moment where, standing at the rudder, he signals forward that he has spotted land that we would now call Newfoundland over the waves. And you see the epic tracing. Can you see the big word that says legend? Now look at the top, you see a, a little, uh, top of Nim for a place, Lance o Meadows, this, this spread of meadows, that's the point where Canadian archaeologists found a Viking community. These are the important people, sorry, they were not Canadian, they were Scandinavians themselves, a husband-wife team of archaeologists and Angelia Ingstad. And up at that uttermost cape in Newfoundland, they were, they were looking at all landing places. If you were coming from Europe, what are obvious places sticking out at you where you might land? It's, as, as our dear Aunt Joan told us kids in the Hale family, children remember it's better to be lucky than to be anything else. Uh, this is true of the Ingstads. 
They went to the place they thought looked most welcoming to Vikings. They went to the beach. They set up a, on higher ground their camp. They went down, they put in a trial trench, and they found a Viking iron nail in the first trial trench. They had found near the beach the Viking longhouse that these Vikings who came to America, people of Leif Erikson's group, had built. This is the reconstruction. They may have done some whaling. I think that's, that's more in the artist's mind's eye. I would not want to try to pull in a whale from a Viking longship. Um, <laughs> but the little longhouse there, a communal dwelling for a, a crew and, and certainly some women as well who came along. And this beautiful bay facing out to the sea. This is its one problem. It's not very protected. And north, northern gales are going to blow right in. But a freshwater creek running down to it, that's the essential thing. Endless supplies of fresh water. This is the reconstructed one as we see it today, right around the year 1000, a great hall. They would all live communi communally together. And can you see how much it looks like a ship turned upside down? Original Vikings would take their lightweight ships on shore, turn them upside down, and sleep under them. That was, that was their way of dealing at sea once you had lifted the masts out. And this is the beginning of the end for Vikings. We have on the left their great talisman, their symbol that people wore around their necks, a golden Thor's hammer. Their favorite god was not Odin, the father god, but Thor, his testy relative, with a short temper and the big f magical hammer that you could throw through the air and like something out of a modern fantasy sci-fi story would hit its object and then circle back like a boomerang to you so you could catch the hammer again. Thor's hammer. Thor's hammer was their emblem, their religious emblem a war emblem, but a spiritual emblem as well, and it is about to be supplanted starting in the year 1000 when the first missionaries showed up in Northern Europe by the object on the right, a bronze Christian cross. And when you turn into Christians, you're letting the air out of the tire as far as Vikings go. <laughs> everything's going flat, everything's going weak, everything is, is depleted by this, this uh, very un-Viking-like message of love your neighbor. So it's curtains. So let's end with the curtains. They like to go or send their leaders to Valhalla in boats. We see even their queens with the Oseberg ship. It's a, it's a story that the, sometimes the boats were set to f in, on fire and pushed out to sea. The dynamics of this, we have to admit, are a little hazy. And we, we don't have, we don't have archaeological evidence of this. If you push that ship out, and let it go, the next waves are going to bring it back to the beach. But let's forget the realities. <laughs> let's stick with this fabulous 19th century final image of our Vikings. The new king standing on the shore with his torch. He's just thrown one torch into the area. Can you see, just to the right of the flames on the ship, the dead king laid out his crowned head toward the shore, and all of his Vikings stripped pulling the ship, the dragon ship, the dragon's head is up in the upper right corner, pushing it out to sea so that the waves and the fire can claim their king. So this is that, that final image that sticks with us. How often this happened, we don't know. We have, remember, more the burials of kings using the ship as a coffin. But it's a long-standing tradition, and it, whether it's that true or not, it emblemizes, emblematizes something for us about Vikings. They are a compound of fire and water. The human spirit of exploration, of conquest, and the waters that carried them to the ends of the earth. The age of the Viking longship, 800 to 1100, they have now sailed into the sunset. Thank you. I'd like to have a conversation with every one of you, but uh, I've been assured by Vanessa the remaining incarnation does not provide enough time for that. So um, I'm happy to take some questions or comments, or as my, my, uh, my old uh, religious ancestors would have said as Quakers, does anybody have a concern? <laughs> yes, way back. Have you had the honor of uh, taking the sail? I sat in the oars when I visited Roskilde, but the boat was at the, at the shore. You gotta have a crew. 
I showed up as a wandering archaeologist. I get, did get to meet Ola Crumlin and Peterson, but the two of us weren't, weren't enough to take the boat out. So I've held the oar in my hand. Uh, I'm just showing you the wondrous work of others. Thank you. Yeah. Can you tell us the size, the length, the, the width, and the, the draft of some of these larger I think Sea Stallion was about... Wait, wait. If, if oh, I need to repeat the question, excuse me. Yes, or, or wait for microphones. Uh, the microphone's coming, but can I tell you about the dimensions of these ships? They vary from things that could be rowed by four, you know, four guy, two on a side, to that sea stallion that you saw, which is the biggest they ever got. That's why they chose to recreate it. I think the sea stallion is still only approaching 100 feet long. Um, they're, they're packing the men in maybe 120, but it's their, um, it's, it's their fabulous clinker bill construction and they, they've always got to be open boats because you've got to be bringing people in and ready to leap over the, the gunwale and hit the beach and fight. So there's limits on what they can be and what they morph into, remember the crazy 19th century drawing that showed that dog headed thing, the broad and beaming thing, that's what they'll morph into. They become part of the great European nation of trading families, they start putting cannons on the boats, they go mainstream. And that's what's interesting to me about the Viking ships. They represent a 2,000 year tradition from the Bronze Age of these extraordinary light vessels, open vessels, vessels where people are gonna have to endure the elements in a way that the only parallel for this, and it's a very honored parallel, the Polynesian canoes, the outrigger canoes of the Pacific who made those epic voyages far beyond the distances of the Vikings to get from their little homelands in Southeast Asia all the way to Easter Island, all the way to the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, the Vikings are colonizers too. But, so I, to me, these are the two great watercraft uh, examples. But um, thanks for the question. Yeah. Did you hear of or attend the exhibit at the American Swedish Institute that featured um, items from the Vendel period? I heard about it. I was not able to attend. And I'm still seeking the exhibition catalog because I know they, would, they had some uh, remarkable, Vendels, it's where we get, they're related to those Vandals we talk about and they're one of these North European people who are certainly cultural cousins of the, of the Vikings. And that was, I know, a groundbreaking exhibit. Did you go? Yes. Well, you want to say a, a brief test, to, uh, one sentence about what, what, what it bears light on with the Vikings? Well, they covered some of the same material you have covered. They had some excellent helmets from that period uh, some things that have never left Sweden before. Oh, wow. So it was quite remarkable. Well, I hope it's still on, it's on the road and maybe we can, more of us can catch My it. My understanding is the museum was being remodeled, so they wanted to clear things out anyway, and that was the only reason why they uh, allowed them okay. to come here. Well, thank you. Um, yes, right down here on the front. I don't have a microphone, but I... You do, you do. It's on the way you at Viking-like speed. You slipped in something about uh, women coming along. Yes. And yet in the artwork and everything seen, can you say just something more about women going along? Yes. You know? If it's a colonizing vessel, women are going to go. But remember, all you women, yeah. you're the ones who count by head count. You're the future. A human society that has nine women to every single man is still a viable biological population. Reverse the proportions, as Viking art makes us think they did. Nine guys, one woman, you're toast in a few generations. So the guys can be put at risk. They're expendable. All of us guys have to live with the fact, yeah, we, made, we invented heroism to get over the, the knowledge. We're expendable as individuals. So all of this is putting people at risk in a way that they didn't want to put women at risk. If I, if I can just, sorry. I'm sorry. I also just wanted to let you know that one of our other spring talks this year is focused on Viking women and textiles. So please uh, check that out. So get yourself back here for that one. And well, although it's at McAllister. Oh, it's at McAllister. And is it a big room? It's where we were last Oh, we were. Yeah, come on down. Um, so who are we? Yes, back, right back there. Were slaves ever taken back to the to Norway. Slaves are a part of every pre-industrial population. They are. They just are. None of us can feel a little glow of satisfaction that we do without slavery. It was a long ago Greek, Aristotle, who made the simple observation. 
until looms can weave cloth by themselves and lyre can, lyres can make music by themselves, there will be slaves. We are just the children of the Industrial Revolution where we got entertainment things that are machines and we got production things that are machines. It's situational for us. It's not moral. We just don't need slaves as our ancestors did. So they're a part of every society. Slaves are also a good thing in that you keep captives from wars because they got a function instead of just butchering them all because there'll be a drain on your society. So there's two, I'm not defending slavery. I'm simply saying it's a fact of human society until Aristotle's prediction comes about. So Vikings, yes, they're like all other pre-industrial peoples. Slaves are there. And part of, part of the rating is to bring back slaves. Yes? So with, with, with the ship designed the way it was, how long could they stay provisioned and stay on the water without having to pull up on land to get fresh water? And well, the longest documented runs are part of Leif Erikson's runs across the Atlantic. It's a long haul to Iceland. It's a long haul from there to Greenland. It's an even longer haul from there to Newfoundland. So those are the maximum runs. When they're down in the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, they're hitting the shore every night. And that's what they'd like to do in Scandinavian waters. They're not, and you can see it's not got a, easy accommodations for a big crew. And by the way, it's usually ships of Knarr type with a small sailing crew that are making the long voyages, not the ones through the rivers of Europe. Those are the sailing ships. But once you're out in the Atlantic, it's a Knarr type rather than the classic Viking dragon ship that's making the open sea stuff. So they can put on cargo and, and uh, take stuff with them. <coughs> we got one, yes. Yeah, and can you comment on the navigation methods that they used? This is one of the great miracles of all time. It's a side rudder. That is how they steer, and they did a lot of celestial navigation. They knew the skies. That's another reason for traveling in the summertime. Clouds move in in the winter. Hard to steer once you're out of sight of shore. But most of their voyages, they are either hopping from one known land to another across a stretch of sea, or they're coasting voyages. They want to come to shore for lunch. Uh, I mean, they, they, so they're going along coasts, and their, their map of the world is a series of shore stations. And you move from one to the other and get to your destination. So you'd always want to have old hands on board who could tell you about that stretch of waters and guide the steersman to the right place. Yes? Where was that museum that you said is your favorite? I think I, I said it was the Roskilde Museum. Oh. And that's, that's the Viking ship museum there at Roskilde in Denmark at the south end of that fjord where they found the, the sort of fleet of, of Viking ships sunk. That's, that's my favorite. But, but I love the, the Oseberg ship. I, I've never a museum I didn't like. But uh, the Oseberg ship museum I would, I would put in there as an equally compelling thing. And if we want to get a little bit beyond the Vikings but uh, Scandinavia, no greater maritime museum than the Vasa Museum of that great Swedish royal uh, warship of the House of Vasa brought up out of Stockholm Harbor. It sank on its maiden voyage. Uh, the crew was trapped behind cannons as they slid across the deck and the ship went down. And it's, it's a, like a time travel experience to see that museum. So lots of great Scandinavian museums on shipping. Um, typically, how many, how many of the uh, long ships might go on a, a raiding uh, trip? And how many how many people would be involved in one of these? Voyages? Right. I'm not saying the Vikings are cowards, but they're realists. There's no harder military maneuver in the world than hitting the beach that's held by the enemy and prevailing. Think of, think of Normandy and D-Day, which is where my granddad stormed ashore and tried to establish a beach end. That was tough. Uh, that was a near-run thing, whether it could even happen. So the Vikings are aware of this. So they try to tend to... Uh, Travel in packs of ships. A lone ship is not a good prospect hitting a community. And attack like wolves, sure they will overpower the lightly defended folks that are their targets. That going up to Paris was a rare thing. They didn't usually hit the big cities. Big cities are risks. Vikings are risk averse. I mean, it doesn't look like that when you tell the overview of their story. But moment to moment planning, they just want to be sure they can win. And cities make that hard. So uh, I can't give you exact figures and things, but it, it tended to be finding isolated shore stations uh, where there can be no word of their coming, they can hit. And let's not forget, their favorite target is monasteries, for crying out loud, <laughs> where there's not a single art man to oppose them, and there's a great big treasure in the church. So um, they, are, they are of the ho same heroic temper as 
Achilles and the other Homeric heroes, it's not entirely admirable. Uh, not something you can show to your kids and say, grow up and be like a Viking. Um, <laughs> you, you don't want that at home, especially in their teen years. But uh, <laughs> I think it's important to know this story because there's still elements, let's face it, of, of our dynamic, explosive, rapacious Western culture and mindset that goes straight back to these ships of a thousand years ago. And we need to come to terms with that. And we've got, oddly, remember they were done in by Christianity. If you really re read the commandments of Jesus, it's like you've gone 180 degree from every single Viking value. We are, we are caught between these two. And in our major elements of life, I've got to say the Viking element in us tends to prevail. So we've got this countervailing force. We live in a world where their violence, their rapaciousness, their, their, uh, they're determined to it's all about what I can do and the heroic vision I'm going to leave behind to myself. Uh, we've got an alternative. And if I can be sermonizing, like my great-grandfather, the Baptist preacher, um, that's the one I would like to think that's, that all of us and all my students can remember. That's the alternative. And for us all to, who was our great American who said, why can't we all just get along? It's that way rather than the Viking way should, we should be glorifying and emulating. We've got one right here. Right down here on the front. Were there different were there differences in the boats um, from the Vikings that is now Norway, Sweden, and Denmark? There are slight differences between every boat builder. Remember, they don't have plans that you can go down and buy at the nautical shop. Uh, you are apprenticed to a master who has he will have every master shipwright will have a team of of young fellows who are going to be technicians to their world rather than warriors. And they are going to have the master's way of laying out a ship, designing the ribs, and so on. There are differences between every single Viking ship we find. We've, and without Roskilde, we wouldn't have any of the actual long ships, the fighting ships, just those that were sunk to block the harbor or that. So we have a very tiny representative. But there are variations there. They, sec they suggest a sort of ad hoc, um, uh, by, by, uh, by thumbs reckoning view of a nautical shipping tradition. There were clearly no drawn plans. Uh, it was all passed down through the generations by each new apprentice following his master's methods, memorizing his master's ratios for width of hull versus length of hull. None of that survived. But we know en enough of the differences to know they conform to a single type, but there are variations that represent just the, the schools of the creators who made them. We got right back in the middle. Um, how far into the Americas do you think that? I'm, the, hold up your hand. I'm, uh, you already got it. Um, Thank you. I, I couldn't see the mic at your mouth at first, oh, and I thought I jumped the gun. Your thoughts on the pro on the prospect of Vikings making it down the Hudson Bay and into ultimately into the Red River Valley? Yeah. Well. <laughs> You've met the Vikings now. The presence of a Viking cannot be hid. They litter the world that they touch. Just show me the litter and I'll buy the theory. Until then, it's, there are so many reasons people want to claim, Americans, many of whom are in Viking descent, want to claim Vikings got to where they currently live. I'm still waiting. Bring me the, the Viking, uh, Viking, that Viking penny was found in Maine. That's, that's a run for them down from Newfoundland. But getting into the, the Great Lakes system, what are they coming for? Algonquin baskets? Uh, <laughs> this is not attractive to them. If they'd gotten to the Caribbean and could run into Aztec and Maya, you bet they would have hit the beaches. That was gold city. If they'd found the Inca, my lord. But those were civilizations that could have handled them, trained warrior and soldier societies, and they would have been in the minority. So I don't think. I, I don't think they, they got much beyond where we find the record today. And their sagas don't suggest that. And remember, the sagas, they're not exactly history. They're, they're what Homer's Iliad and Odyssey are to what really happened in the Bronze Age. But they nonetheless suggest the range. We've got a whole Leif Erikson saga about getting to, to the, uh, that bay that we saw in Newfoundland, Lanceau Meadows, with names and events and power struggles within the group and all kinds of things. Uh, we don't have anything that suggests they got beyond that. This is probably a good 
the place to stop. And I've just been told this is the place to stop. <laughs> By our own local Valkyrie. May the wind be in your sails. Till next time.